Good morning. And yes, it is still a good morning, even though you had to wear a coat today. I'm not happy about that either. But uh, if you're visiting us here for the first time at FBC Cameron, there's a little white slip in the pocket of the chair in front of you, uh, just for us to be able to stay in touch with you and you know learn how we can pray for you. On behalf of Impact Youth, I would just like to say we are all very thankful that you have joined us for worship and for fellowship today. And uh, in fact, we as the youth of this church have a lot to be thankful for. We have plenty of wise individuals who we can look up to that provide advice for us in our own personal walks with Christ, parents who model the Christian-like adults that we are striving to one day be, and a church leadership that provides us with the tools that we need to be a light, we need to be a light for Christ amongst our friends and in our schools. Even with all of these things that God has given us, sometimes we're not very good about thanking him for them. Things like just having a Bible or a ride to church and being able to go to church and having a country that allows us to do so. So as Nathan and Faith touch more on Christ-like gratitude as we get later in our service, we are so thankful to have you have joined us here for worship today. And let's just remember what we are thankful for and what God has given us. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, welcome to First Baptist Church. We're the found, we're the youth band, and we're very thankful to be here with you guys this morning. Uh, please stand with us as we sing our first song, Holy Water.
First Chronicles 16.34 says, Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. God is so good, and his love is endless. This is goodness of God. Can I have all the kids come down? Can I have three volunteers of you guys? Susan, and then you can be Johnny, okay? Okay, so this is Johnny. Um, he has a sad story because his dad, no, because he doesn't have anyone to teach him how to read. 
In, this, in his country, there are no schools. Who do you think can help Johnny with his sad story? Yeah, who do you think can help him, though? Okay, um, this is Susan. She has a sad story because there are no people in her life to teach her about Jesus. In her country, churches are against the law. Who do you think can help her? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then this is Alice. She has a sad story because she's very sick. She has gone to many doctors, but she can't do all the things that her friends can do. And she is too tired from her treatments. Who can help her? You notice how God was said in all of those? God can help us through hard times. And each of these stories remind us to thankful hearts and the good things that God has given us. We can use our good things to help other people feel better. So we are going to learn today about how to be grateful and thankful for God. Kay. And then I have some hand turkeys that you guys can color. And you can write down what God be can be thankful for. Is this the complaint desk? Yes. Can it I comment is. on anything? Yes, you may. Well, there's construction in front of my house. And I have to go two miles out of my way just to get to my house. I see. Anything else? There's also tar all over the place, and it's ruining the underside of my vehicle. All right. Is that all? And my wife blew $300 on a blouse today. <laughs> all right. Anything else? I think that's it for now. All right. If you just have a seat over there, you can fill out these forms. Next. Yeah, I am sick and tired of being sick and tired. I have no energy, and I can't seem to stop yawning. It's driving me crazy. I've been to the doctor. See, he says I need to exercise and all that nonsense. But it hasn't been working. So you've been exercising and seeing no benefit. No, I haven't been exercising. I'm too tired to be exercising. Don't you see the nonsense in it all? It's a lose-lose situation. All right, so your complaint is against your body or your doctor? My doctor and my body. My doctor for being a moron and my body for being fat and lazy. Okay, 
I'll need you to fill out these two papers and fill out the box that says joint complaint. It's not just my joints. You will also need to explain why your doctor is a moron on the bottom of page one. Well, that is no problem. I might even need more. <laughs> yeah, hey, it's me. Do you have time to bring me another Diet Coke? I'm almost out. Please. No, just forget it. I'll nurse the three ounces I have left. Bye. Next. Hi, um, I'd like to file a complaint. All right. Can I do it anonymously? I'd have to get it approved, but it's usually fine. First, you'll need to form, fill out the form stating you will not hold us responsible if somebody in the company cannot keep their mouth shut. <laughs> Sign here. <laughs> Terrific. Now, what's your complaint? It's my husband. No need to go any further. We have a special sheet for that. <laughs> Just mark all the boxes that apply. And you'll need to write down the chief complaint. All right. Now, I'll have to clear this with the anonymous department. Hold on for one moment. Yes, this is Ms. Wilford down in the complaint department. We have a request for anonymous complaint. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Yes, she's marked all of them. Uh-huh. What's your reason for marking all of them? Because he's an idiot. <laughs> because he is an idiot. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Yeah, she's written here her husband hit a $300 blouse that she bought. Okay, thanks. And listen, can you send that new assistant down here? I'm running out of Diet Coke. I'm almost out and I... What? We're out of Diet Coke? Great. All right. All you need to do is write on the back here your justification for buying that blouse, and then you'll be clear to do everything. Pat? Sue? What are you doing here? What are you doing here? It's anonymous. <laughs> yes? I'd like to file another complaint. About? The complaint desk. Oh, um, I'm sorry. We don't have a form for that. You don't have a form? I want to file a complaint about that, too. In order to make a complaint about a complaint, you have to have the original complaint form, which you don't have. Then I'd like to file a complaint about you. Hey, lay off this woman. She's just doing her job. Plus... She's in desperate need of a Diet Coke. So what, Diet Coke's an excuse for everything now? A bad complaint desk? A $300 blouse? What's next, World War III? That's it, I'm going to- All right, folks. If you just step that way into room four, they'll help you there. They have a specialist who are experts at marriage complaints. And here's a special pack for you both to fill out. Well, you know, I hope you don't get any more Diet Coke. See, Prince Charming at your service. Yes, ma'am. Here's our special form for cynical complainers. Just make it clear that you're not actually calling in Prince Charming. The people in this company might get con sarcasm confused. Who could mistake this guy for Prince Charming? Hey, you're no Cinderella, lady. <laughs> hey, yeah, it's me. I'm sending a couple down your way. I'd use the padded room. Hey, I'm nearly out halfway of Diet Coke. Do you have any extra? No, that's okay. Thanks anyway. Hi, I've had the worst day. Worse than running out of Diet Coke? First off, I got a call from my grandmother. My grandpa's back in the hospital, again. And then my boss wouldn't even let me go see him. And guess what? We lost three clients today. And one of them said it was because I did my job poorly. After that, I caved and ate a Big Mac for lunch. Okay, maybe two. And then my husband called and said he wouldn't be home for dinner. And I had already thought out the chicken. But then I realized something. God can take care of my grandpa even if I can't be there for him. And my boss is normally very rational. I think today was just an off day for him. Yeah, we might have lost three clients today, but maybe tomorrow we'll get four. And maybe instead of getting ab upset about someone telling me I did my job poorly, that I can think objectively about the situation and try and do better tomorrow. Yeah, I probably could have lived without the Big Macs, but... I know how to eat well, and I can do better. 
And you know what? I'm thankful to have a husband who works hard so I can have enough to buy chicken in the first place. So what's your complaint again? Oh, I don't have one. You, you don't have a complaint? No, nope, I sure don't. I'm feeling really blessed today. So what do I fill out? Um, uh, hold on a second. Yeah, hey, it's me again. Listen, we've got a lady here who wants to make an, um, what's it called? No, the opposite of that. Yeah, I can't think of the word either. Um, she's got an anti-complaint. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Okay, thanks. I'm sorry, we really don't have a form for that. Oh, well, what should I do then? Here, take this. Oh, I'm not thirsty, but thank you. No, thank you. It's a glass half full. All right, let us pray. Uh, dear Lord, Heavenly Father, I um, just thank you for the opportunity we have today to uh, worship and praise your name, Lord. Um, I pray for safe travel uh, this week as Thanksgiving's in um, just a few days. And as people start to leave town or um, host people for Thanksgiving, I pray for that. I pray for um, just that we can recognize the blessings God has gave us and to be thankful for that this Thanksgiving. In your name I pray. Amen. Amen. This next song reminds us that Jesus can silence our fears and bring us peace. Uh, so please stand with us as we sing Tremble.
um, as we continue this morning to worship, uh, let's sing about um, how grateful we are for, for all that, that God has blessed us and all that he is, has done for us. Let's sing gratitude. could sing these songs as I often do every song must end and you never do so I throw up my hands and praise you again and again cause all that I have is a for a heart singing hallelujah hallelujah I've got one response I've got just one move with my arms that's wide I will worship you. So I throw up my hands and praise you again and again. So all that I have is a hallelujah, hallelujah. And I know it's not much. I have nothing else to live for again. For a heart singing hallelujah, hallelujah. So come on, my soul, don't you get shy on me, lift up your soul. Cause you got a lion inside of those things. Get up and praise the Lord. So come on, my soul. Don't you get shy on me. Lift up your soul. Cause you got a lion inside of those lungs. Get up and praise Shy on me, lift up your soul. Cause you've got a lion inside of those lungs. Get up and praise the
Um, kids uh, ages four through second grade may now be dismissed for children's church. morning. Uh, thank you so much for being here at the uh, youth-led service that we're doing today. Uh, this morning, Faith and I will be sharing the message, and um, as we start this morning, we'd like to pose a question. What do the clothes that we wear say about us? It's no secret that the way that someone dresses can reveal a lot about them. Without ever speaking to someone, we can notice their attire and gain insight into their profession, their interests, maybe the, the sports team that they support, or their favorite musical artist. So if, if we see a man walking past you down the street wearing a firefighter's uniform, what does this tell you? Well, that, that he's a fireman, yeah. And similarly, if we see a woman wearing a Kansas City Chiefs jersey walking down the street, what can we reasonably assume about this person? Well, that, yeah, that she's a fan of the Chiefs. So our clothes can say a lot about us, and sometimes our clothes may even lead people to develop opinions about us without ever getting to know us. All this is to say is that our clothes can be an important part of a first impression, and we can communicate quite a bit about yourself with the clothes that you wear. The same can be said for the clothes that we wear as Christians. I'm not referring to physical clothing or outward appearance, but rather the traits of Christ that we put on. 
The Bible mentions many characteristics that ought to describe Christians as though we are wearing them. While physical clothes reveal our physical identification, our spiritual clothes uh, should reveal our spiritual identification. Just as we see a man in a firefighter's uniform and recognize that he's a firefighter, we ought to be recognizable as Christians by the way of our character. So, are we putting on these spiritual garments to demonstrate an authentic witness to the world? Or are we underdressed? Paul addresses this subject in his letter to the Colossians. Paul wrote the book of Colossians while he was in prison. He wanted to warn the church at Colossae about the threat of false teaching in their midst. He was specifically interested in showing how Christ is far more important than religious tradition. When he gets to chapter 3, he encourages the church to prioritize heavenly things above earthly things. He distinguishes the old man, the characteristics of a lost person, from the new man, the characteristics of that person when he is found. In verses 5 through 11 in chapter 3, we see the clothes of those who are of the world. Sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desire, greed, anger, wrath, malice, slander, and filthy language. After Paul finishes his list, he urges the church to put on new clothes. Clothes that identify someone who is in Christ. As you can see in your sermon notes, this is the main point of our message this morning. Christians ought to dress themselves in clothes that identify them as Christ followers. Paul tells us what clothes we ought to wear in verses 12 through 17. So that's where we're going to spend our time there uh, this morning. Let's read Colossians 3, 12 through 17. It says in verse 12, Therefore, as God's chosen ones, holy and dearly loved, put on compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, bearing with one another and forgiving one another if anyone has a grievance against another. Just as the Lord has forgiven you, so you are also to forgive. Above all, put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity. And let the peace of Christ, to which you were also called in one body, rule in your hearts and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell richly among you in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another through psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. And whatever you do in word or in deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Let's pray before we get into the content of this text. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this day, Lord. Thank you for giving us all the opportunity to gather here together, Lord. Thank you for letting me, Nathan, speak this morning. I pray that you just prepare everybody's hearts and just that um, you just help them get something out of this, Lord. Uh, love you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. In, this, in this text, Paul has several exhortations for the church at Colossae. We've, conden we've condensed them into three main exhortations which tell us what clothes we should put on. Beginning in verse 12, Paul presents a list of characteristics in contrast to the previous lists in verses 5 through 11. God's people who are set apart for him should be noticeably different than those who are of the world. This list of virtues should describe those of us who are Christians. So here's point number one. Put on Christ-like virtues. Put on Christ-like virtues. The virtues that Paul lists in verse 12 are not the same kind of virtues that he adds in verses 13 or 14. So we need to consider what he's doing here by giving us three different kinds of virtues. Let's start with the list in verse 12. These seem to be traits that individuals should display. Every individual person in the church ought to put on these five virtues as he or she pursues Christ-likeness. As we consider what it means to put on Christ-like virtue, first we recognize the virtues that are personal traits of a life in pursuit of Christ. And this is subpoint A, personal traits of a life in pursuit of Christ. So Faith, can you tell us about these personal traits? All right, let's start with compassion. Depending on your translation, you might just see the word compassion. You might see compassionate hearts, tender mercies, bowels of mercies, or something similar to one of those. The Greek word is, oops, uh, hopefully I didn't butcher saying that which means a deep awareness of another's suffering or sympathy for another's suffering. And Paul say especially the inner parts of the body, or the bowels, were viewed as um, another's suffering. And Paul say especially the inner parts of the body, or the bowels, were viewed as uh, where the emotions reside, which is why one or two translations use the word bowels. Compassion requires us to be more about other people than we are about ourselves. 
we can get to be so self-involved and wallow in our own distress to a point that we distract ourselves from other people or ignore what's going on in other people's lives. Jesus was never that way. He had compassion on people. In Matthew 14, 14, just before the feeding of the 5,000, the verse says that he saw a great crowd and he had compassion on them and healed their sick. May we have that kind of compassion for the people that Jesus had on them. The next trait is kindness. Kindness is a display of goodness towards others. Someone who is kind is warm and inviting. Romans 2, 4 tells us that God's kindness is meant to lead us to repentance. When a lost person who is living in sin and comfortable with the wickedness gets to know a Christian who displays a kindness that is so radically different than the way they've experienced, God can use that kindness to win that person to Christ. Next, we have humility. This is a big one. There are so many ways to be prideful and so many things that we can be prideful about. You can't even think or say that you're humble. Uh, we should temper our view of ourselves and take the attitude of Christ whose humility is described in Philippians 2, 5 through 8. Have this in mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who thought he was in the form of God, did not count equally with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. The next trait is gentleness or meekness. A standard Greek lexicon for the New Testament defines gentleness as the quality of not being overly impressed by a sense of one's self-importance. This definition binds gentleness with humility. Being gentle also means being mild and even-tempered. There is no need for hostility or an overly aggressive or combative temperament in the kingdom of God. The last of the five traits Paul mentions in verse 12 is patience. Actually, let's just skip this one. I mean, do we really need another reminder about being patient? In all seriousness, God has been so patient towards us. He continues to be patient to allow for as many as possible to hear and respond to the gospel before enacting his judgment on the world. He continues to hear us as we tell him how sorry we are for our sins and then go back to those same sins not long after. If he is so patient towards us, it just shows how much we have to be patient to other people. As much as people can just be the worst sometimes, we ought to be like Jesus and being patient even towards the most difficult people. Isn't that right, Nathan? That's right. Now, this, <laughs> this list is not exhaustive. There are other characteristics that Paul could have added. In Galatians 5, he lists what we know as the fruits of the Spirit, a list of nine traits which also includes a few of the ones we've already talked about, kindness, gentleness, and patience. These virtues are connected to each other in that as we improve on one of them, we improve in many of them, perhaps all of them. As we pursue Jesus, the Holy Spirit will work in us to make us more like him and to develop these traits in us. So now let's move on to verse 13, where Paul names a couple more virtues, introduced in a different manner than the first five. So let's look at this verse again. It says, bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other as the Lord has forgiven you, so you must also forgive. These seem to have a communal aspect to them as they apply to how people in the church interact with each other. And this brings us to subpoint B. Christ-like virtues don't only include personal traits, they also include communal compassion of a church in pursuit of Christ. Communal compassion of a church in pursuit of Christ. We don't only pursue Christ individually, we also do so, we also do so corporately as the church. Obviously, we can develop the virtues mentioned in verse 12 together, but Paul gives us a couple ways to rightly act toward each other in the church. The Greek word for bearing with is anakome, which means to endure something unpleasant or difficult, whether on one's own behalf or on someone else's behalf. Basically, bearing with people or circumstances has the sense of putting up with them. It can be done, but it can be done begrudgingly. In Matthew 17, we see an example of Jesus bearing with his disciples. A man has brought his son to Jesus' disciples, and they were unable to cast the demon out of him. So then the man brings his son to Jesus. 
In verse 17, Jesus expresses frustration with the disciples' lack of faith. He says, O faithless and twisted generation, how long am I to be with you? How long am I to bear with you? But Paul does not stop there. Merely bearing with each other is not enough. We must also forgive each other. Paul provides a rationale for why we must do this. Because the Lord has already forgiven us. All have sinned against God, who has ultimate eternal authority. For him to forgive us, and yet for us to fail to forgive others, would completely undermine our reliance on God. Christ offers completely undeserved forgiveness to all who put their faith in him. So we should forgive others whether or not they ask for it. Paul said the same thing to the church in Ephesus in Ephesians 4.32. Christians should be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving one another just as God also forgave you. The Christian church should reflect God's forgiveness by offering it to one another. Putting on Christ-like virtues involves developing the personal traits that were mentioned in verse 12, the communal compassion as described in verse 13, and one more thing that Paul addresses in verse 14. Above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. Paul notes just one more trait, that being love. But notice its increased significance. Love is a binding agent. The rest of the virtues just can't hold together without this one. And this brings us to subpoint C. Putting on Christ-like virtues involves the essential bond of love in pursuit of Christ. The essential bond of love in pursuit of Christ. Love is regarded above all other traits. Without genuine Christ-like love, the other ones that have been previously mentioned, the other traits that are previously mentioned are worthless and fail to accomplish their intended purpose. So faith, why is that? 1 Corinthians 13, 1 through 3 says, If I speak in tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. If I give away all I have, and if I deliver up my body to be burned, but have not love, I gain nothing. Paul goes on to say that love embodies many of the very traits he included in Colossians 3. Patience, kindness, humility, and forgiveness, among others. Love binds the church in unity. You could say that love is the foundation upon which all of other traits are built. Unfortunately, our society today has decided that love can be whatever people want it to be. Christians are called to love sacrificially the way Christ did. Jesus gives us the prime example of what love truly is, laying yourself down for others. May we always stand for true biblical Christ-like love as opposed to false, hollow, worldly love. In verse 15, Paul tells us something else that we ought to put on. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. In addition to putting on Christ-like virtues, we put on Christ-like peace. And this is point number two. Put on Christ-like peace. The peace that Paul is referring to here is probably the same peace that he refers to in Colossians 1.20. Through him to reconcile himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. This peace is not merely an individual feeling of being stress-free, but rather a state of being. The salvation accomplished by Jesus also brought peace between God and people, as well as between people. And Paul continues by saying that this peace ought to rule in our hearts. So Faith, how does that work? Well, Nathan, we are all sinners at odds with God until we submit to his lordship over our lives. We also ought to submit to the peace that comes with salvation. The word rule here in the text is the Greek word brabuo, which means to be the factor determining an outcome, basically to arbitrate. It is no longer we who make decision, decisions on our own, letting our emotions get the better of us. Instead, we yield to the peace of Christ to determine what decisions to make, what to do in difficult situations, or how to resolve t the tension in the church fellowship. Letting the peace of Christ rule in your heart means allowing the knowledge of what Christ has done for us and the inward calm that we enjoy as a result rule of our actions. When we try to take control, we become subjected to frustration, fear, or even anxiety. When we let God have control, we can be at peace. This is a passive action. Paul gave us active actions in verse 14. 
bearing with one another and forgiving each other, while here in verse 15, he gives us a passive action, letting the peace of Christ rule. There is peace that is fleeting when we look to other things to fulfill us, other people, riches, better circumstances. Any peace that comes from the world is temporary. But if we keep our eyes fixed on Jesus and if we trust in his accomplished work, not only do we get salvation to be completed later, but we also get lasting peace while we wait for Jesus to return to make all things new. This is what the church is called to, peace with God and with others. We are all on the same team, part of the same body. We're not competing with each other. Unity is the goal, and the peace of Christ is the means to make it happen. Well said. We're called to peace as members of one body. So let's let his peace rule, not only individually, but over all of our hearts collectively. Paul continues to discuss how the people of the church should behave toward each other. But now the rationale is proper disposition toward God. Let's look again at verses 16 and 17. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Commentators disagree on precisely what is meant by the word of Christ. Some think it refers to the gospel, the message about Christ. Some think it refers to the words that Christ spoke as recorded in the gospels and perhaps in the oral tradition passed along from the, from the apostles. Uh, some think that it could be both. It seems to me that both the message about Christ and Christ's own words have similar benefits, and we would do well to let all of that dwell in us. As we, con as we consider our disposition back toward God, Paul has given us one more item of clothing to put on, Christ-like worship. And this is point number three, put on Christ-like worship. As we put on Christ-like traits and let Christ's peace rule, our lives are transformed. And we can glorify God in all that we do. By prioritizing God's word, we can regularly grow in and be encouraged in our walk with Christ. Making the Bible the ultimate authority of our lives helps us push aside outside distractions that pull at our attention and lead us astray. We need each other for help in our, growth and, and, and in our growth and discipleship. We need people in the church to pour into us, to teach and admonish us. There are two aspects of Christ-like worship that we find in these last two verses. The first is specific acts of worship. And this is subpoint A in your sermon notes. Acts of worship. Teaching and admonishing or encouraging by way of exhortation are both acts of worship. So is singing to God by way of different kinds of songs that praise him. Paul may have had in mind in verse 16 that singing to God by way of different kinds, oh, sorry, let's move back. Paul may have had in mind in verse 16 that singing could be the means by which the church teaches and admonishes each other. Consider Ephesians 5, 18 and 19. Be filled with the Spirit, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. What Paul is not saying here is that singing is the only appropriate means of teaching and admonishing. But when the church is gathered corporately and we're singing to the Lord together, the words that we sing can teach and admonish us. It's also possible that Paul is trying to list teaching, admonishing, and singing merely as distinct acts of worship without using singing as the means of teaching and admonishing. Once again, commentators do disagree as to the relationship between the first two terms and the third. Whatever the case, Paul mentions three different kinds of songs that are appropriate for the church to sing in praise to God. So, Faith, what distinguishes psalms from hymns or spiritual songs? Well, Nathan, they are certainly not completely different from each other. There is a significant overlap. But, of course, there's disagreement among commentators as to the exact distinctions between the three kinds of songs. Psalms probably refers specifically to the book of Psalms in the Old Testament. Hymns could refer generally to songs of praise. They could be specifically Christian songs, or they could be songs even more specifically praising Jesus. Perhaps we could just say that hymns are songs written by Christians that were not taken from the Psalms, but that were used as praise songs to God. One commentator suggests that spiritual songs distinguished from hymns by the way of the audience. When we sing hymns, we address God, but when we sing spiritual songs, we address each other. Unfortunately, 
it's not so easy to determine exactly the distinctions Paul had in mind. But thankfully, we have some general possibilities, any of which may fit what Paul is trying to communicate in this verse as a whole. It seems as though as long as the songs we sing in church are properly praising the Lord and, and encouraging each other to worship him, then they will fit one of those categories and will serve the function that they were meant to. But worship is not limited to specific actions. There are acts of worship, as mentioned in verse 16, but verse 17 seems to consider worship to be a lifestyle. Everything we do can and should be done in Jesus' name. Worship is a matter of the heart, even more than the words we say in the songs we sing. When we put on Christ-like worship, this involves the acts of teaching, admonishing, and singing, but it also involves our hearts. This is subpoint B, the heart of worship. Heart of worship. Worship is not meant to be restricted to when the church gathers corporately, though corporate worship is highly important. But worship should not begin and end with a Sunday morning worship service. Paul urges Christians to worship God in everything that we do, in every aspect of our lives. Many of you may be familiar with the song, The Heart of Worship by Matt Redman. He addresses this very concept that worship goes beyond the songs we sing. So listen to these lyrics. I'll bring you more than a song, for a song itself is not what you have required. You search much deeper within. Through the way things appear, you're looking into my heart. God doesn't just want our outward actions or words. He wants our hearts. He wants all of us. Think about all that it means to put on the right clothes as a Christian. We can never do all of that perfectly. We will always fall short, and we will always be underdressed. But one more thing that I want to draw your attention to is the thankfulness that Paul mentions in verses 15, 16, and 17. In each of those verses, the attitude of thankfulness is just tagged on at the end, as though Paul is assuming that we already know how important it is to be thankful. The repeated inclusion of thankfulness reminds us that as we put on the traits Paul lists in Colossians 3, an attitude of thankfulness should remain at all times. It is our gratitude for all that, Christ, that God has done for us, especially for Christ's love and sacrifice, that leads us to desire to put on these traits. We seek Christ's likeness as a response from our thankful hearts. Sometimes life can become overwhelming, overwhelmingly busy, and we can easily lose sight of our true purpose with all the distractions present in our lives. In the midst of this, it's important to remain thankful for everything that God has given us. Putting God at the center of our hearts and lives will transform us. Deciding daily to choose an attitude of gratitude keeps us right where we need to be, acknowledging our complete dependence on God. When we consider the ways in which God has blessed us and how lost we are in our distraction-filled lives without him, we can't help but to express our gratitude to him. As the song the band sang earlier says, our gratitude is not much, but it's all we have fit to present to our king. With Thanksgiving coming up, it's important to remember to thank God in whatever season we're, cur we're currently facing. I'm thankful for my family, all my friends, my whole church, and this day we've been given, the trials and tribulations that have developed my dependence on God, and so much more. I'm thankful that God sent Jesus to die for me for all of us on the cross. I'm so grateful for this sacrifice that God demonstrated his perfect love toward us and offered us the opportunity to spend our eternity with him despite our sin that separates us from him. While we sinned against the, the eternal God and earned an eternal punishment, Christ died to save us all from that sin. All we have to do to be saved is put our faith and trust in him. And we all have that to be thankful for every day. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Dear God, I thank you for this uh, opportunity to gather here today and to, to learn more about you and to, to be in your word and to worship you together. Uh, I pray that, that not only in this season of Thanksgiving, but that throughout the entire calendar year and throughout all of our lives, that we would remember to have an attitude of gratitude and an attitude of, of thanking you for all the things that you've blessed us with and thanking you for the ultimate sacrifice that you made to save us. And so, again, I just thank you for this opportunity to be here today. And uh, I pray over uh, the following week for everybody here. And uh, yeah, amen.
as the youth band has returned to the platform, they're going to lead us in a song of invitation, an opportunity for us to respond uh, to the word that we have heard this morning. And as, as we sing this song together, I would ask you to consider this question. Are you clothed in Christ's likeness? Are you clothed in Christ's likeness? And we know that that begins by having Christ as our Savior and as our Lord. And if that is a decision that you have never made, you cannot recall the time or a time in your life when, when you admitted to God that you were a sinner, that you professed your belief in Jesus Christ as the Son of God who, who died on the cross for you and resurrected from the dead. If you have not confessed him to be your Savior and your Lord, then today can be that day. Today can be your day of salvation. And so you have the opportunity as we sing these words together to, to come forward. If you would like to pray that prayer, if you would like to visit with someone, if, if, if maybe you recognize that you haven't been faithfully putting on the clothes that were spoken of this morning. Maybe, maybe you find it challenging to live in those Christian virtues. Maybe you find it difficult to have peace amidst the turmoil of life. Or, or maybe, maybe you've not yet accepted that lifestyle of worship, recognizing that worship is more than what we just do for the hour that we come here together on Sunday morning. But it's the way that we live each and every day. And so however you need to respond during this time, this is your time. This is our time, just our time between us and our God, just to allow him to continue to speak to our heart and for us to respond as he so desires. So would you join me as we sing along with our youth on this invitation song?
going to have you be seated for just a moment. Isabel's going to come and share some announcements as we get ready to close. But before she does, let me just uh, first extend, let's extend our thanks to our youth for sharing in the service this morning. I know there's much written and much said about the, the dangers of our teenagers falling away from their faith. Uh, sometimes it's likened to, you know, they graduate from high school, they graduate from church, uh, and they graduate from all things God. But, but our, our prayer, our prayer as a church should be that it would not be so with our kids. And, and that comes back to us. It comes back to us praying for our teenagers, praying for our collegiate students as they're away from home, as they're on those college campuses, continuing to pray for them, but also giving them opportunities like we give them by doing this service. You know, we're giving them an opportunity to, to discover and to utilize the gifts that God has given them because they are part of us. They are part of the body. And we want them to exercise those muscles. We want them to use those gifts so that they won't see a need to go somewhere else in order to use those things, but they can use those things within the body, within the church. And so a special thanks to Pastor Aaron, our youth minister, for the work that he does in preparing them, in working with them. And, and so our thanks to him and, and, and just, again, encouragement to our church to continue to pray for these teenagers and for our children. Obviously... Um, <laughs> We place a strong emphasis on children and youth ministries here at First Baptist Church because they are the future of the church. And so we, we thank God for them. So Isabel, come and share some announcements. Then they'll have their closing song with us, and we'll be dismissed. Okay, so tonight at 530, we're going to have a Thanksgiving service, um, sing some songs and share what we're thankful for. And that will be over in time for the Chiefs game. Um, if anybody bought a pie from the youth fundraiser and you said that on your order form that you come pick it up, don't forget your pie. Um, uh, the church office will be only open on Monday and Tuesday and until noon on Wednesday. And then next Sunday is the first Sunday of Advent. Oh, it's almost Christmas. <laughs> Um, all adult Sunday school classes will meet in the gym at 9.30. Uh, there won't be hot breakfast, but everyone is invited to bring a pastry dish. Um, next Sunday at 5.30, there will be a new member orientation. Any adults interested in attending should talk to Pastor Terry. All right, well, before we uh, leave, we're going to do one more uh, chorus of holy water. So if we could all stand together, we're going to end our service with that. Your forgiveness is like sweet, sweet honey. Like the sound of a symphony to my ears It's like holy water Your forgiveness It's like sweet, sweet honey on my lips It's like the sound of a symphony to my ears It's like holy Thank you. Have a good day.